I've just been so excited. Everyone's presentations have just been amazing. <laughs> um, so, Buju, everyone, Karen Indigena Kaz, Houghton and Dunjaba, Um, Thank you for the opportunity to share my work with you today. Um, I am the lead math instructor for the Kiwana Bay Ojibwe Community College. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in computational science and engineering. And so, this is a share of my experience in the math department. And um, I'd like this research to be found a foundation for developing assessment tools and to help quantify these barriers and the equity indicators for indigenous peoples in higher education. So historically at Keweenaw Bay, our math courses have been a barrier to the necessary progress for student success. And research shows that underrepresented college students are disproportionately held back by gateway courses, which is leading to lower graduation rates. Our students come from different backgrounds and life experiences. And so in teaching math, the one size fits all approach was not serving us and it wasn't serving our students. And so that's why addressing the equity issues in the classroom has been really important. In our mission as a tribal college, the medicine wheel, which I, um, I borrowed this one of the holistic model of balance in living a good life. You know, this medicine wheel is foundational in all of our teaching. We, we have this as a foundation when we develop our learning outcomes in every other field or every other um, classroom except for the math department. So we are doing a pretty poor job on establishing this model in the math classroom. So when we report on the indigenous practices and identity with respect to the math learning outcomes, it's really disjointed until we learned about the Carnegie Math Pathways curriculum and the growth mindset pedagogy. And so I hope that through this presentation, I can share with you the transformation that it made in our classrooms. So the Carnegie Math Pathways has a pedagogy that um, is defined as student-centered. So the, there's a collaboration where that's the student-centered approach to problem solving. And this, I kind of adapted the mindset to the, everyone in this classroom is on a journey to learn. The other part of the pedagogy is the deep learning. And that's where students achieve this level of expertise, but it comes from the critical learning opportunities. So what we're doing is we're normalizing this productive struggle. We're all figuring it out and we're making connections and we're increasing that complexity of the math problems and the understanding over time. And then the last part is that community building and this and the pedagogy where it focuses on helping students to develop what's called the growth mindset toward learning and build strong learning strategies and that sense of belonging in the classroom. And I was really fascinated at how easy it was for us to align the indigenous pedagogies, that decolonization um, ideology where success persists in communities where we acquire and we develop and we sustain relationships with each other and our environment. Um, and so collaboration supports that revitalization, that self-representation um, and stronger, more effective relationships. And we see that not only in the classroom when we have our students working together in groups, but also when they go out into other places. So it's really helped us to allow for the students to internalize what it means to be in a math classroom. Everybody has a sense of belonging. A couple of the things that we did in the growth mindset to indigenize that collaboration. So here's a few of the adaptations that we took because it in, it's very colonial in the sense, but there were so many ways that it weaved into indigenous ways of knowing. So in the collaboration, when you have a group collaboration, I've identified what the 
curriculum calls the leader, students didn't feel like they knew enough to be called the leader. So when we first started do, developing group work and you call a student the leader, there was a reluctance there because the students are like, I don't know enough to be a leader. I can't lead you all because I don't know. So we internalized that. And instead of calling the student the leader, we call them the navigator. You're the guide. It doesn't mean that you're the expert, but it does mean that you're the one that's going to help provide direction for your group. And you're going to help to carry us on this, what are we going to do next on this journey? And students really responded well to that kind of mindset. Um, another role in the group collaboration is the caretaker. In the, in the curriculum, originally, it, it's called the facilitator. We modified that to call them the caretaker. And this is the person that is responsible for taking care of the group. Are we going too fast? Are your ideas being heard? Do you understand the material before we go on? And a lot of our students already facilitate those kinds of roles in their home, whether they're caring for children or for elders. And so it was really easy for the students to internalize what that role means in the context of working in a group. One of the other roles that we modified, as opposed to saying, after your group meets, then you're going to report out. We say, you are the storyteller. You're going to tell the journey of the conclusion of your group. And it's not that once you get the right answer, tell us what you, what you found. It's how did you come to this conclusion? What kind of collaborations did you have? You're going to tell the story of that journey, because everybody's story is going to help to impact someone else. Under the deep learning, you know, that productive struggle, that's something that the students have really had to learn to internalize that it's okay to struggle, that this is, this is what happens in the classroom. And all of the teachings that we have, we start with the foundation of the seven grandfather teachings, especially under the community building. So when we embed the seven grandfather teachings, that's the teachings where the students learn how to conduct their selves in the classroom and how to treat others. And one of the activities that we do very the very first week is the students write a letter to themselves as a struggling student. And they use the teachings of the seven grandfathers, the wisdom, encouraging themselves that learning is going to take time, um, loving yourself and being at peace with where you are, uh, the respect you know, how we interact in the classroom and how we share ideas with each other, that bravery, um, being able to participate even when the risk of being wrong is gonna be uncomfortable. And just, you know, honesty, being realistic with the expectations of yourself, that humility is that, you know, everyone is equally important. And the truth, that's that grounding knowledge that we're seeking. Right. And so all of these things that we're already adapting in the math classroom, we're internalizing it in indigenous ways so that the students are able to identify with what are we really trying to do. So here's the fun part. This is um, a graphic of where we were. So this starts in 2011 and this blue line shows the um, overall enrollment. So of all the students enrolled in our institution, it's pretty common for about 10 to 20 percent of our student population to be in a math classroom. Okay. And for the most part, the gray bars show that the majority of the students who are enrolled in math classes, most of them are enrolled in lower level math courses. So they're in um, math labs, they're in basic math, they're in, you know, the first year math courses, and they're actually repeating those courses several times before they actually make it to the upper level math courses. And this is the trend until 2017, when we started to adapt the Carnegie Math Pathways, this indigenous ways of knowing curriculum and trying to pivot this growth mindset into the way that we teach. And as you can see, it did not take long for everything to turn around. You've got enrollment, increasing. You've got enrollment overall in all the math courses in, is it increasing. And you also see that the upper level math courses enrollment is increasing. So not only are students actually enrolling in math, but they're actually persisting to where they're getting to the math courses for credit. 
which was just phenomenal. I mean, historically, that had never happened. And of course, you have the year 2020, um, COVID. But you know what? I wanted to leave that there because every part of the data tells an important aspect of the story. And, you know, the research that I'm sharing is the trend. And so we can dig into the data and explain what happened, you know, with uh, barriers and the implications of COVID. That's, a, that's another story. So I'm not ashamed of this dot here. This is part of our journey. So just to kind of summarize, so our math enrollment overall, we had a 99.58% relative increase in math enrollment in our entire institution. This is pre-post. And then the upper level math courses, we still had a relative increase from um, of 23.32%. So, I mean, it's still phenomenal what was happening from the trends from 2011 all the way until 2019. So we continued with some more statistical analysis. So this also shows the growth mindset students and then this is the um, students under the traditional um, curriculum. So the green is the number of students who passed with a C or better and the blue are the number of students who failed. So it's not that the growth mindset curriculum ensures that students don't fail. We still have that, but the proportion of students who pass is greater in the new curriculum than in the old curriculum. And I mean, there's so much more to tell to this story. You know, how many, how many fewer students are, are not repeating the courses and how they feel about themselves, what they can do with this curriculum after they're done. So this is my little fancy chi-squared um, just for statistical significance, but I'll talk about that on the next slide. So we have our comparison study of 192 students who were enrolled in um, KBOCC math courses between 2011 and 2019. 123 of them took courses under this traditional mindset curriculum, textbook, answer questions, take a test, you know, take a quiz. 69 students in the study were under the growth mindset curriculum, where it was more of a holistic approach using the pedagogy that I described. So the courses that we compared all had similar learning outcomes and they were students who were taking the course for credit. So the students that were excluded were students who were auditing and students who were in basic math and math labs because we don't have a comparison curriculum for the growth mindset with those, um, with those with that, with that course. After analyzing the data, 78.3% of students in the growth mindset curriculum passed in contrast to the 56.1% of students in the traditional curriculum. And when you compare the frequencies, that is statistically significant. The difference in those proportions of, um, you know, 0.22, that is statistically significant. And I've included the p-value for people that that's important too. So the implications that I'm interested in is how the growth mindset curriculum is more inclusive. So these implications can be further studied in my research, which is social network analysis, because my hypothesis is that this new curriculum is bridging that equity gap. In social networks, we look at connectedness and the idea of using networks to study assessments and develop metrics is really interesting to me. So for example, on the screen here, you have this star. And in a network, the ties are relationships of some sort. Maybe they're in class together. Maybe they both graduated at the top of their class. When you have a star relationship, this center node, that person or that individual has an advantage over everyone else in the network. And this is what we would see characteristically with the old curriculum, right? You've got a student who was able to take higher level math courses in, in high school before they came to college, students who are younger or they come into college um, 
shortly after leaving high school, you know, all those things that a lot of our other students who are single parents, their grandparents, maybe they are coming back to school after a certain term of life, that pedagogy, that curriculum was not serving them. It only served this particular type of student. What we want to see is more of a circle network where every student would have equal advantage of success. And in this case, success would be passing their math courses so that they can actually um, you know, get their degree. So certain students with certain attributes in this new model wouldn't necessarily have an advantage over the others. And so my prediction is that there would be a greater diverse population of students that are more likely to pass the higher level math courses under the new curriculum than the old curriculum. And so in my first study, I'm going to develop a social network analysis that's going to have the outcome of pass and fail to determine that connectedness. And what I want to see is a decrease in what we call isolates. And isolates are people that are not connected because they didn't pass. They were enrolled, so they're in the network, but they're not connected because they did not pass. And then in another study, I'd like to look and understand what shared characteristics create that certain outcome you know, those characteristics that become ties between students. And that is what we would use to create a score to predict whether students pass, just understanding the dynamics of enrollment and passing rate. And this is where the foundation could be for our assessment metrics for student placement when we report to HLC, because it's it would be um, more indicative of what's important to us and what, what our students actually go through. So um, this is kind of the beginning of the study and what I'm interested in and why I feel like this would be a more appropriate way of quantifying success than our traditional method of AccuPlacer score, GPA, because those things aren't telling our story in its full truth. And then eventually, yes, I will get to studying the effects of COVID on our progress, because I do feel like prior to COVID, we had reached this epitome where, I mean, what was happening in our classroom could not be denied, that there was definitely a trend, there was definitely something working in the classroom. And so once I can build the network and use all the metrics to show this is these are this is how we're connected and this is how we're helping our students succeed then i'm hoping that that metric can be you know can be used by other tcus or other institutions to help to find where are their barriers where are where are their equity gaps and how they can um, how they can uh, use this metric to address those so that is that's the end of my presentations. I will welcome any questions at this time. 